it might be fair to say that for all of human history, racism has been an issue. Notable examples in the last centuries being the African-American slave trade, the Holocaust of World War II, Rwandan genocide, the residential school atrocities right here in Canada, or the recent ethnic genocides which have taken place in South Sudan against the Rohingya Muslims or Syrian Christians. Each of these examples are absolutely horrific. But does systematic racism exist in Canada today? Well, according to the government of Canada's website, though it's less violent than the examples just stated, racism appears to very much be present. According to the website, foreign-born visible minorities in Canada earn on average 78 cents for every dollar earned by non-visible minorities. Black men face a larger earning gap in the private sector than white ones do, while black women face this gap both in the public and in the private sectors. Indigenous people represent 4.9% of the Canadian population, but account for 23.1% of the federal offender population. Indicating, this is indicating a potential racist gap in our judicial system. 48% report of reported hate crimes targeted Jewish communities and 30% targeted the Muslim community. These types of stats have caught the attention of our legislators to the extent that over $40 million of the 2018 budget was directed towards anti-racism engagement, strengthening surrounding services and targeting supports for the black community specifically. Government concern for this issue is encouraging for sure. At the same time, it can't be the only source of change as change begins in the hearts of people. There is no testimony that I know of which illustrates us more profoundly than that of the journey of a man named Matt Lockett and another man named Will Ford. Matt, whose personal ancestors owned Lockett's farm, the believed location where the final shot of the Civil War in the United States was fired. Matt, also a direct descendant of slave owners. Will, the direct descendant of African-American slaves who prayed fervently and daily for their freedom and for the freedom of their children. Their lineage and storylines intersecting in a powerful convergence generations later of healing, reconciliation, brotherly love, and present day mission. On today's show, we are going on location to hear their jaw-dropping story and let it inspire faith that truly God alive in the hearts of his people is the most effective healer of racial divides. So let's get to it. So even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow. I still have a dream. This nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Yeah. With me, I have Matt Lockett and Will Ford, William Ford III. And in my hand, I have your baby here. This is yes. actually, I neglected to say in the intro that these guys have actually written a book about their story. It's called The Dream King, How the Dream of Martin Luther King Jr. is being fulfilled to heal racism in America today, right? right. So tell us your story. It is absolutely mind blowing. Yeah, it is mind blowing. What the mind blowing part for me starts honestly with the people who risk their lives to pray in actually had me in mind when they prayed. Uh, we have a story in our family about a 200 year old kettle pot. It was used by the slaves in my family. They used it for cooking, they used it for washing clothes, but secretly it was used for prayer. And uh, their slave master didn't want them to pray because it felt like prayer would foster hope and he thought they would run away. So he would literally beat them if he heard them pray. But these folks, they loved Jesus and they decided to pray anyway. And so what they would do is they sneak into this barn on the plantation late at night to make sure the prayer meeting wasn't seen. But to make sure it wasn't heard, they used this cast iron cooking kettle. And it's about this big around, about that deep. Uh, hopefully we get pictures of it so you can have it here. But uh, they would sneak with that barn at night. So what they would do is, <clears throat> middle of the night, they take that kettle in there with them and they would take it and turn it upside down on the cabin floor. They would invert it, then prop it up where rocks would be suspended off the ground about an inch or two. Then they would prostrate themselves or lay, lay flat. They would lay flat on the ground and put their lips in between the opening between the ground and the kettle so that the kettle muffled their voices as they prayed through the night. And Faitin, the fascinating part is this, is that for me, I was told that they didn't think they would see freedom in their time. So they prayed for the freedom of their children. 
in their children's children's children. And so their hope pray. was in their children. Yeah, they, they pray for the freedom of their children and the next generation. So one day, freedom comes. There's this young teenage girl. She was part of those prayer meetings. And all of a sudden, freedom comes to her. She decides to keep that kettle pot and that story in our family. So why would she do that? She's probably thinking about all those who have risked their lives to pray for her. She's probably thinking about all those who have who can enjoy the freedom that she's about to embrace because they're so old. So she keeps, she keeps that kettle pot and that story in our family and she passed it on to Harriet Lockett. Harriet Lockett passed the kettle and the story down to Noah Lockett. Noah Lockett passed it on her son, William Ford Sr., who then passed it on to William Ford Jr., who then gave it to me, William Ford III. And so for me, what it's been is this amazing reminder of all these people who risked their lives to pray and contend for spiritual awakening, honestly, because, you know, think about it, it wasn't just black Christian slaves, also white Christian abolitionists back then who, you know, if any person was a slave or a Christian, they know that person was their brother. These folks laid their lives down for each other, but it was the prayers of that godly remnant of abolitionists and black Christian slaves that prayed into being the first and the second great awakening. So powerful. You know, and you are evidence with skin on that yeah. God answers prayer, right? Because, yeah. wow. So we could just stop the story right there and be like, Wow, that's a story. Yeah, that would be good enough for me too, right? Yeah, but you know, I, I didn't jump in there, but your lineage has the last name of Lockett. So yeah, we start out as Lockett. Let's talk about yeah. the intersection here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so before Will and I ever found anything out about this story that we've put in the book, you knew us, and so you've kind of had uh, a I've front had row the seat. aha moment. I right. watched the aha moment. You went through it with us mm -hmm. in, in a sense, and so I'm really provoked when I listen to Will talk about his family history because in my family, we didn't know our history. In fact, we couldn't get past my dad's grandfather because when you look back in history, there had been courthouse fires and a loss of written records, but probably more importantly, somewhere along the way, people just stopped telling the stories, you know, the family history stories that, you know, you grew up hearing. And so in my, in my family, we never knew where we came from. In 2004, uh, I went through a really tragic experience when my dad unexpectedly passed away. And one of the things that became really important to me during that time was I really wanted to figure out what our family history was. I wanted to try to discover, is there anything interesting about our family's past? And the more I dug into it, the more frustrated it, I became because I couldn't, I couldn't find anything out. I've got cousins on top of cousins that have looked in the past and no one's ever been able to figure it out. And so uh, I was uh, really frustrated, and it was during that time in 2004 that I had a dream. And so in my dream, I uh, met a man named Lou Engel, uh, who I didn't know, and I, uh, I reached out to him and his team uh, only to find out that they were going to Washington, D.C. Uh, the following uh, years, just a few months after I had the dream. And they invited me. They said, you should come. We're going to do a prayer gathering at the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. So the Lincoln Memorial, uh, that is uh, in honor of uh, one of our past presidents, Abraham Lincoln, who was the president uh, leading the nation during the time of slavery, actually when slavery came to an end uh, during, uh, at the end of our Civil War. Mm -hmm. uh, so in 1865, uh, that's when slavery ended. So he was our president, and we've and he was against slavery. He was. And uh, we have this memorial in, in uh, the city uh, dedicated to him. And this group was going to be doing a prayer gathering on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. That just happens to be the same place where Martin Luther King Jr. stood and said, I have a dream. And so many people... Gave I that think, famous speech. That yeah, I think everybody all over the world yeah. is familiar with that yeah. speech. So I went. I went to the prayer meeting. And it was there that I came into contact with Will for the very first time. So our first coming together was right there on the steps where Dr. King. At the feet of the monument stood. of a man who helped lead the charge to end slavery. Exactly, <laughs> and so uh, I actually got to hear that day Will tell the story about the kettle and about the slaves who prayed. And when Will told the part of the story that the kettle had come down through the Lockett family, like it grabbed my heart because obviously that's my last name. and went up to meet him after, afterwards, and you know, we started comparing notes, and he's like, well, how, do you, how did your family spell it, with one T or two? And we spelled it with two, and he said, well, our lockets spelled it with one. And we thought that was a nice little coincidence. But then he's like, well, where were your lockets from? And 
And I, I mentioned, you know, the part of the country that our family, as best we knew, where they had lived. And he said, well, our lockets were down in a, a separate part of the country, pretty far away. And so we thought that was another coincidence, but it was pretty neat. It was enough, though, that, that we struck up a friendship and, uh, and really a, a relationship where we began to run together in ministry and go around the nation and lead prayer meetings. And so that's kind of how our lives came together, uh, touching on this story. But then, you know, that was really just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, in the dream, I go to try to pick up this baggage, but before I could touch it, Dr. King grabs me by my shoulders and he says, no, do not go back and pick that up. And he starts telling me what I need to do to heal the race issue. June 2020, something incredible is happening. The Canada Summit for National Progress. This is a strategic gathering for people who love Canada and want to see it reach its full potential. At the summit, you will hear from knowledgeable speakers who are experts in their fields, giving insight into some of our nation's biggest challenges. Then together, participants will dream and strategize, looking for ideas to solve these challenges through policies, inventions, innovations, or community initiatives. Some of these ideas will be launched right at the summit to impact the lives of Canadians for the better. We believe that the Canada Summit for National Progress could be one of the most significant transformational gatherings in our nation. Canada needs people who can face problems head on, but then look past them with a spirit of hope to find the solutions. We hope you'll join for this cutting edge gathering of dreamers, innovators, and doers. Let's build a better Canada for the future. Toronto, June 2020. To find out more or register, visit canadasummit.ca. Register soon as capacity is limited and optional VIP networking events are expected to sell out. www.canadasummit.ca. We love Canada, and we want to see it strong for generations to come. That's why we do this show. We can't do it alone. We need your help. Unlike commercial TV, this program is 100% donor funded. If you'd like to see more episodes produced on important issues for our nation, please consider signing up to be a monthly partner or giving a special gift today. Every gift makes a real difference, and all gifts are tax deductible. Together, we can build a better Canada for the future. Visit fayteen.tv or call 613-552-5572 to donate today. So I had this dream with Martin Luther King in it, and uh, God was basically using that dream to show me how he wanted to raise up a new civil rights movement that included everybody this time, and um, did this in this dream. So in the dream, I, I'm on my way to Martin Luther King's old church, Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, with a good friend, spiritual father to me, Lou Engel. He's in the dream. The and, same guy that was in my dream. Yeah. And so we, we're on our way to this old church of Dr. King's, but in the dream, we couldn't get there until we first picked up Dr. King, right? So it's a dream. So we go by this house and Dr. King's alive because it's a dream. But it, in the dream, Dr. King has this huge white duffel bag with black handles on it. And he starts emptying all this dark garbage out of the duffel bag. Then he throws the bag down violently and he comes to get into this vehicle with us. And in a dream, I thought, you know, that, that'd be a pretty cool souvenir. You know, I'm all starstruck, right? It's Martin Luther King, right? <laughs> so uh, in the dream, I go to try to pick up this baggage to be my souvenir. But before I could touch it, Dr. King grabs me by my shoulders and he says, no, do not go back and pick that up. And he starts telling me what I need to do to heal the race issue. And so I, I begin to weep in the dream, but I wake up and I've been, I've been weeping all night in intercession. I didn't even realize it. I shared the dream with Lou. He begins to weep. We're like, God, what are you saying with all this? I'm like, God, remind me, what did Dr. King say to me in this dream? Hmm. And the Lord said to me, William, the white bag with the black handles, that will be the interpretation for your dream. Then I realized what the black handles represented. The black handles represented how I, as a black man, had handled my white baggage. God was saying to me, William, get rid of your white baggage. You've been carrying it for way too long. Been carrying it for That's way too a long. Strong word. It was, you know, but I when knew. When you consider what you've been through, what your family's been through. Like right. You know, well, I knew what he, the Lord was putting his finger on because, you know, 13 years old, I know what it's like to be chased by a car load full of white guys called the N word and, and uh, saying they're going to shoot and kill me. They were joyriding, but they, you know, we were scared to death. Then later on in 19, uh, police officer falsely accuses me of shoplifting and we couldn't find anything. He 
you know, tries to provoke me into a fight by saying ugly things to me. And then later in my thirties, my first house, the first, you know, the new neighborhood, that same police officer for the first three months would just stop me for just driving while black. That's what we called it back then. And, uh, but, and, 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 but you know what, what happened? Any person in that area of town that was white or a police officer, I put on them those three experiences. In other words, before I had a conversation with anybody, I put on them, I projected on them those three bad experiences. That they would that, be racist. Just yeah, like that they would be just, they're just like everybody else. So God is saying to us all, you know, get rid of our bitterness. What color is your baggage? Mm. Get rid of it. Wow. Because we need each other. Wow. And yeah, it's going to take a united church to heal a divided nation. Wow. Yeah. But that's not the end of the story. No. So. Four years ago, Matt learned something that's pretty powerful. Tell him what you learned. Right? Well, think about this for a second, because I, I, like, I like to point this out. Uh, just to highlight how God is, he's not just in control of things. Like, I think it's easy to say that, but to, to highlight that God is really involved in our lives far more than we give him credit for, mm -hmm. that Will would be led to the steps of the Lincoln Memorial by a dream. And I would be led to that exact same spot by a dream where he would then connect us in relationship and we would begin to do prayer gatherings around the nation. So we were getting ready to do one of those prayer gatherings in the state of Virginia, which is, that, that's a, a, it's right in sort of the mid-Atlantic region of the United States, and it was a real key strategic area during the American Civil War. Before we did that, we decided we had to go uh, to visit a, a very significant historic location in Virginia, which is the, where the Civil War ended. It's a place called Appomattox Courthouse. And uh, we went there to pray uh, and as we were leaving, we went to like a little visitor center, you know, where they have like a little bookstore and things like that. And uh, Lou Engle was there. Uh, we step up to a bookcase side by side, and he grabs the first book off the shelf that catches his eye and opens it to a random page. And he kind of lets out a shudder because he's, he's like, what is this? And he shows it to me, and it's called The Battle of Lockett's Farm. I had no idea what that was. And it was the Battle of Lockett's Farm, spelled with two T's, just like my name. But you know, it's that same moment where when I met Will the first time and I heard the story of the kettle and I heard my name, and then here I am again in another moment where I'm hearing my name called, and, and boy, that's and really something your name in the book. that we need. We need, God wants us to find ourselves in the story that he's telling for, all, for our nations. I mean, the story of a nation is a collection of the stories of our lives, you know? And so uh, I buy that book and I start to research it. What I found out, was the last battle of the American Civil War happened in the front yard of a family named Lockett near uh, Appomattox Courthouse. And I thought that's another amazing coincidence. Right. And it was right about that time uh, that my older brother actually got breakthrough on our family genealogy and the things that we've never known about our history. He uh, called me and he's like, I got us all the way back to the year 1645. We actually came over from England as settlers to the state of Virginia. And I thought, oh man, if I got a, a Virginia story for you, and I started to tell him what I just shared about the Civil War, and he stops me, and he says, that's not that place down by Appomattox, is it? Which is the, the geography that we were just discussing. And I said, that's exactly where it was. He said, oh, I just found the documents on it. That was our family. So now think about this for a second. Will's ancestors as slaves were praying for the ending of slavery under the kettle uh, down south, my family then uh, has the last battle of the war that ended slavery in their front yard. And I thought, what, what an amazing uh, coincidence of how these things began to line up. But then what I did was I actually went and visited that site. And there's a man who lives there. Yeah, the place exists to this day. It's been preserved. And he begins to tell me a little bit of the history that he knew about the Lockett family. And some of it we had known about where our family had moved. But then he said this. He said, you know, in some cases... Some moved to the deep south, but in some cases, you know, the old handwritten ledgers, when they would take a census and record names, they would accidentally misspell the name. And he said, so in some cases, they dropped one of the T's and only spelled Lockett with one T. And now I'm thinking, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, this can't be possible. Can it really be possible? And so I gather up all this information and I live that in Washington, D.C. Will lives down in Dallas. And I just went down there, and our families just kind of laid it all out and stared at it. And honestly, we just cried. We, just, we talked and prayed and cried. And we poked holes in it, you know, because 
Yeah, I'm a researcher. He's a researcher. We don't like, you know, flaky stuff. So we, we spent another year doing more research. So what we learned through more research was that it was Matt's family that owned my family where that kettle pot came from. So think about it. Here's my family praying for the ending of slavery, right? And then all the way up at the farmhouse of the people who originally owned them and God ends the, ends the Civil War in their front yard. He hears, hears the cries of prayer. But then, because he's the God of the past and the future, he connects two people from those same family lines together, Matt Lockett and I, and weaves our storylines together so we could war against injustice in our day and cry for awakening in our time. And then he inspires a man to write a speech, to yeah. prophesy yeah. the very life that you, like what's the part of the speech where he said, I have a oh, dream. Yeah. yeah, he said, he said, Say it for he, us. Yeah, he, said, he said, I have a dream that one day that the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners could sit together at the table of brotherhood you know, so we're thinking like maybe the dream street, maybe the dream speech wasn't poetry. Maybe it was prophecy. Yeah. Maybe there's a dream king or the king of kings who has his prayer that his father's going to answer. It's John 17, Father, I pray that they will be one so that your glory could come so that the world would believe. God's going to answer his son's prayer. Yes. And he's going he's, he's gonna to use North America to heal <laughs> the pain that's in the earth. They're talking mm -hmm. about the North American church. And I say North American church because Canada, you're, you're, I love this nation because it was so key to my story because the Underground Railroad came through Canada. And talk yeah. about that because I think a yeah. lot of Canadians don't yeah. know our role in, in helping free yeah, some yeah, of this. Yeah. Yeah. Led to Canada. So Canada was the place for freedom. Matter of fact, the code name for it on the Underground Railroad was the Promised Land. The promised land. And so um, uh, slavery, of course, we know uh, really horrific in the South. Well, it was just horrific at all. Just to own another human being is horrific. And to think that today over 27 million people today are bound in human slavery in some shape, form, or fashion, whether it's sex slavery, human slavery, it's still, go, it's still going on. But uh, uh, people were escaping from, uh, from, uh, from, from the United States out of slavery by coming into Canada. And they had this... Uh, Underground Railroad is what they called it, but it was a secret different alliances a lot of, of people. Many of them were Quakers, uh, uh, Mennonites, others. But there was the, there's this coalition of abolitionists and, uh, and revivalists and preachers and others who were white and another uh, black freedman at the time period who formed this alliance to free slaves. And the, the thing was is to get them out of slavery in the South all the way up to uh, freedom in Canada. So Will, what would your word be to Canada in light of this profound history? Canada is going to be used once again to be a place of refuge for people to, to, to get set free. Canada is going to be used as a place to bring healing to all the nations of the earth. Canada is going to be another carrier of revival again in a powerful, powerful way. And so I believe God's going to use Canada in a powerful way to to bring unity and this oneness that God's been looking for in John 17, because that's the destiny mm -hmm. of this nation. Wow, profound. The healing of the nations. Now, let me ask you a question. Sure. Okay, so, you know, when we think about racism in the United States, like we're, we're thinking about the black-white issue, even still to this day, obviously, it's, you know, at peak in, in some areas. It's a real right? challenge, yeah. yeah. But here in Canada, you know, we've got our own issues, you know, the history with the First Peoples of Canada, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit. Um, you know, there was a separatist movement in our not so recent history with French and French speaking Canada. Uh, you know, just a few months ago, Alberta talking about separating over the pipeline issue. There, there is, there's racial tensions, there's um, division. Mm -hmm. What would your message be to people that are, are wrestling? with the baggage? Well, it's, it's going to start one with forgiveness. Uh, really, I think the keys, the keys to revival are in the hands of those who've been the most uh, oppressed. And the key of forgiveness can set the whole nation free. And I think if people, especially believers, we understand the privilege that we have with our relationship with the Lord and who we are in the kingdom, we can actually put our privilege at risk to see other people flourish in powerful, powerful ways. I think those two things, the release of forgiveness and people appropriating the power of their privilege in a way that seeks the human flourishing of all, that's what's going to bring healing. Matt, you have anything to say? For me personally, I'll speak personally, and then I think, you know, a lot of people will be able to relate to this. 
I think it's going to set a lot of people free, is that uh, you can imagine like how I felt when I, when I discovered that my connection to this story was to that of the slave owner. Like suddenly... And that your ancestors had beat his ancestors Right, and, and I'd been listening to years about these stories of even ancestors, family members who had been beaten to death. And suddenly to find out that my connection was to that of the slave owner was very, very hard. But it also provoked something else, and that was to dig a little deeper. Uh, I went back to another time of historic revival, the First Great Awakening in America. And what I found out is that revival had come to that area of Virginia where the lockets were. And the Lord led me to read this history where I found out that one of my ancestors, a man named Daniel Lockett, had been caught up in the revival and became a Methodist circuit rider. Now, what's interesting about the circuit riders is that they carried the gospel to the frontier. They carried Bibles and hymnals, but they also carried something else, and it was called a manumission form. At that time in history, the Methodist circuit riders were staunch abolitionists. Wow. So if I went back a little bit further, yes, my family had slave owned, you know, we owned slaves, but but if you go back a little bit further, God had already started another storyline. And there were promises, I like to think of it this way, there were promises that God made to my ancestors that they didn't see fulfilled in their lifetime. It came in a later generation. And I've, I think that all of us have an opportunity to discover what, what are the unanswered prayers that have gone before us. And then we have an opportunity actually to become the answer to those people's prayers. So yes, we own slaves, but Go back a little bit further. There's redemptive promises in all of our family lines. And what storyline are we going to be a part of? The healing of the hurt, the blessing of the curse. What storyline are we going to be a part of? So. I have a dream. The sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be, be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. Thank you for being with us today for this special feature with Matt Lockett and Will Ford. I pray it has inspired faith in your hearts for how God can heal the wounds and divides in our lives and in our nations. You know, we love Canada, and that's why we do these shows. Our goal with these programs is to cover important topics impacting our nation and provide practical tools on how we can build a better Canada for the future. We can't do this alone, though. As a charitable ministry, we are 100% dependent on the generous donations of individuals like you who care about the future of Canada. So we want to invite you to consider signing up to partner on a monthly basis or give a special gift today. When you sign up to partner for $50 a month or more, you'll receive a special gift from us as a token of our gratitude. Thanks for your consideration. Every gift and every amount makes a real difference. Call 613-552-5572 or visit faithteen.tv to join the team today. God bless you and God bless Canada.